comes in and the services are really long, I think you're experiencing a bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they call us supply ministers, because we supply time. But here in this time, I really want to discuss with you what's in a name. And with a name divine, would it by any other name be as sweet or as toxic? So years ago, on the stage of I, th I think I've had so many tech issues. Can people hear me now? Yeah. 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 You can hear me now? Yeah. Nodding. If you can't hear me, do something like this in the back. <laughs> and I will try and keep my hands away from touching my body. <laughs> <laughs> this is a... <laughs> Years ago, on a stage on the south bank of the River Tides, a poor young boy dressed as a rich young girl stood on a stage step that was a balcony, or maybe it was a window, playing the part of... Juliet. 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 And these immortal words. Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, not a Montague. What's a Montague? It, it is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face. Oh, be some other name belonging to a man. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo doff thy name, and for that name, which is no part of thee, take all my self. Now, most of you know that I hold the complete works of Shakespeare as one of my sacred texts. And within that, specifically the first folio, which you just heard, is the closest thing we have to what the actors spoke, the stage manager script, what the audience heard. And in that particular version, it says word. It says, by any other word, would smell as sweet. That's been corrected in most of your texts to say, by any other name, would smell as sweet. But here's the difference, because suddenly you have words, wood. You have kisses blown into the air. You have smelling, sweet, because the mouth can't open any wider. Suddenly, in my teenage mystical heart, when I discovered that, ah, would God by any other name smell as sweet? Or would his name that is used as talk? as corrected. I've heard a man claiming while protesting outside the building of the mosque he would never worship Allah. He was a good Christian man, and he was, he was. That was how he identified himself. He was completely unaware that Allah is simply one of the hundred Arabic names for God. There's actually more. And in this sacred holy time of Ramadan, not only are the Arabic who identify as Muslim, praying to Allah, so are the Arab Christians praying to Allah. It comes from, and I'm going to butcher this, and I apologize, Al-Ayanah, which means the God, or the, or one God, or the one God. That's what the word means. So this loudly professing, self-identified, white American Christian man was simply speaking out of his fear and xenophobia rather than out of his faith and direct experience. As I scoff at such myopia, a bit smug in my intellect, you've been there. <laughs> I found myself in seminary class really struggling with new vestments, lying in a cell, looking up above my bed was a crucifix with a body on it. And there was that word, Lord. And I'm willing to bet that I'm not alone in struggling with that word here. Anybody? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But I couldn't turn away from my experiences. She's cutting this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm free! Yay! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my. Yeah. So, so, I mean, sometimes 
translation is best heard first. I will do my best because I also have hearing augmentation and I know how difficult it is to hear. So we're going to go for this. Good. I couldn't turn away from my experiences of the divine. I could not deny that I had been touched by the sacred countless times, saved day and a day and a day, in many ways, small ways and great big ways. I do not so much believe in God as I experience God, or that which we call God, because God is just a nickname. But Lord? Oh, Lord! <laughs> my little inner feminist was not going to get over that word, especially when you get my Lord and Master attached to it. <laughs> that starts going into my DNA. I have such oppressive scars on our historic hearts, toxic shame and deeds done in the name. It's hard enough having a hard time with gendered language of God in the first place, right? My inner revolutionary has no use for kings and no use for monarchs. And of course, I'm wrestling with all this, and I'm wrestling with it outside, because I tend to write my sermons outside and inside in the rain. Rain. <laughs> Did it rain this week? <laughs> so I'm outside, and then an insect flew past my patio, with wings, orange and black. A butterfly? Monarch? God is a butterfly? I had never heard that. My little place went, oh, I can grab a hold of that. So I dug a little deeper, grabbed a hold of that, dug a little deeper. And yesterday I woke up to the television set being on, I woke up early, we have dogs, and St. George Chapel in Windsor filled the screen. And the first hit me as I watched yesterday morning was so many titled persons. I have a title, do you have a title? Have you given yourself a title? Give yourself a title. <laughs> now. <laughs> and of course, stars. But it can be said that American Episcopal priest, Reverend Michael Curry, stole the ecclesiastical show. He did. <laughs> yes, he was wonderful. In a stirring sermon at the fairy tale wedding of the sixth in line for the great throne of Great Britain, Meghan and Harry. If you have not watched it, no. Google it. Watch it. It was awesome. But it was the prayer from the Queen's chaplain, Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkin, QHC, that's been running in my head over and over and over. It's more difficult to find. In that she spoke and invoked, faithful God, holy and eternal, source of life and spring of love. Faithful God, holy and eternal, source of life and spring of love. And that idea that not only am I faithful because of my experiences, that which is a nickname is also faithful because it is experiential. And in that moment, I started making automatic translations for the rest of her prayer. And the rest of her prayer is beautiful. It's beautiful. It is us in love to the world us in love to the world, us in love to the world, our hospitality to the world, our love to the world, us to the world. And I thought about our need for the stories to shape our world. And clearly, a royal wedding is such a story. And this particular one, a story of unity and diversity and the transformative power of love, is a story of hope. And ultimately, that is perhaps what we need most out of the names that we choose for the unnameable access to unconditional love and hope. Because a moment ago, everybody here in this space was a little hurting. You go into a meditation and you take off the gloss and there's going to be a little suffering. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of suffering. You take off the gloss, there's going to be a little pain. And what we need is knowing unconditional love and hope. But even as a beautiful, independent, American biracial woman walked herself down the aisle of Windsor Chapel, the gendered mosaic language, which we use all over the globe, pokes me. History does matter, especially when her story has been so silenced. And it has actually served the power structures of the world to have the divine, male, and monarchical. After all, the emperors, who were first chosen by the gods, ordained by the gods, after death, all became gods. And the Queen of England is still the head of the Church of England. Just a look. It appears that the word Lord and Adonai and all of its variants were not even part of Mosaic canon until the 4th century BCE. Before that, there was the 
idea that we had many names like leaf and elk and lion and no name. Before that, in the written scripture, it was the letters Y-H-W-H. Called the Tetragrammaton, you've heard of this? Some, yes, yes. It's sometimes pronounced as the non-word Yahweh, uh -huh. which then became Jehovah. We can date that to the Moabite stone. I know, the Moabites, we actually get it from the, I like that. Um, the Mesha steel, it's around 840 BCE, but if you prefer to have a Hebrew reference and not a pagan reference, two silver scrolls date from the 6th century BCE confirm. But written sacred texts were also full of sacred wordplay. The book of Esther has no name of God, no tetragrammaton, <coughs> but the letters are found in complex acrostics all throughout it, as can be found throughout the entire Tanakh, the Torah, every other ancient text. You can find it in Sanskrit. God is in the details, metaphorically and textually. But because, both historically and as most mystics can co occur, concur, the name is unnameable. So what do you do? The word scholars refer to as the ineffable name. I like that, ineffable, I looked it up. What does it mean? It means too great, too extreme, to be comprehended. Too extreme to be comprehended. And that's where language fails us. We are storytelling animals. We need words. I rather love Webster's usage example of ineffable. Quote, the ineffable natural beauty of the Everglades. <laughs> <laughs> and any of you who've ever been there can yeah. attest. It's divine. It's sacred. It is ineffable. So back to the ancients, the mystics, the shaman of the desert, or oh, the richness of the names that you find. Elohenu. Yah. Yah, like breath. Yah. El. El is actually written as nickname for that which can't be named. El. And yes, God is a nickname. Then you have Yah El, the right hand of God. Adonai. Adonai often gets translated as Lord, but it's also able to be translated as Father of the Land. Beloved Father and Family Head. One of my favorite names of the unnameable is Hashem. Hashem literally simply means the name. <laughs> That's what it says. In the name of the name we pray. The name. Because it's the biggest name that we have no word for. Shem, but it has ha, the <coughs> X over Shem. Coming back to mm. <coughs> Latin, of course, has Deus, also has Dominus. Mm -hmm. Dominus from domicile and Domine. You can see how these things get muddy as time goes on. Latin, Kiros, Master. But the Sufis take it back. The Sufis have who, H U, who, the breath of creation, who, the first sound. But the Slavic language is the word is bog. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I'm going to pray to bog. <laughs> it totally works for me. Did you hear about the Unitarian Universalist in Somniac, dyslexic animal trainer who went to seminary? Whoa. <laughs> yeah. She stayed up all night, night after night, contemplating the existence of dog. <laughs> I got it. Sorry. <laughs> stuff. I mean, in November of just last year, the National Church of Sweden voted to change the gendered language and remove the Swedish equivalent of the word Lord from their church. The change is taking place in churches today. Wow. This is the day. Their guidelines are not mandates, but her, H-E-R-R-E, -R -R -E, is to be discouraged. Although it's worth noting, the official Swedish language has now an official gender neutral pronoun. It's hen. <laughs> it's not mentioned in the guidelines. The guidelines are replacing he and him with simply God and the Holy Trinity and the Holy. Thus, in Swedish, God is good. good. God is good. The American <laughs> Evangelical Lutheran Church changed their liturgy in, to, in the 13th. Because language is created and used by humans, it reflects the imperfections and limitations of humanness. Therefore, no language can ever totally describe or represent God. And there they use the word, which is the non-word. I like 
as David Paulson reports in the same article, under language describing God, eagle, rock, light, among others, before offering a caution about pronoun use. So language describing God, eagle, rock, light. But if you're going to assign a pronoun, quote, assigning male pronouns to human occupations, such as judge, teacher, potter, or to objects, fortress, rock, or shield, is to be avoided when they are used as metaphors for God. And on January 28th, this year, the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, D.C. This year, Washington, D.C. This is also the home of the National Cathedral, in case you want to have a context for that, said in a resolution, if revision of the Common Book of Prayer is authorized, to is authorized to utilize expansive language for God from rich sources of feminine, masculine, and non-binary imagery for God found in scripture and tradition, and when possible, to avoid the use of gendered pronouns for God. This is a huge change in the story that we tell ourselves of what is holy. And of course, you know, we want to put ourselves in the UUs. We came to the party in 78, and then in hymnals, because it's the closest thing we have to a Book of Common Prayer. And what we wrote in the preface of that hymnal in 78 was, the history of hymnody is a history of amending and altering words to fit music as it current needs. Changes are prompted sometimes for psychological, sometimes for theological reasons. This collection of revisions for many of the most popular hymns of the Unitarian Universe congregations must continue in historical process. We seek to move beyond gender and language of our worship. The old patriarchal forms are contrary to the present needs and ideals. If any portion of a congregation feels excluded by the words sung or spoken in unison, the words fail to express the intended community. Here's the problem. Words are always going to fail. So we have to be gentle with ourselves because we have to be expansive. We have to continuously work in translation. We don't want to get cocky, though. I mean, we did it in 78, and these guys are just coming to it this week. <laughs> the Shakers were doing it in 1850s. <laughs> when they were declaring and praying Mother, Father God, and the Hindus have always had multi-gendered forms, even though almost all the Upanishads are translated with a male pronoun he, even by people who I hold as being deeply enlightened. So for those of us who rankle at the word Lord, we have good company in many faith circles, many communities. And yes, the word Lord was used in society because it was and still is patriarchal. But rather than dismiss it and say, well, that's why, I just don't have to think about that anymore. I wanted to go deeper into the word. Because like, where does the word come from? Why do we have the word Lord in English? That's my native tongue. <coughs> it comes from loaf ward, or bread keeper. It is actually an ungendered term for the one who provides and protects our sustenance. The one who provides and protects our sustenance. Huh. It's part of how I was able to pull this out and start really thinking about my experiences then, the one. Huh. Even if we bake ourselves, even if we're feeling like the little red hen, and I have to say that on that rainy day a couple days ago, I was definitely the little red hen. <laughs> she needed earth and water and fire and air. She needed seeds and sunshine to bake her bread. The Lord Mayor of a town in the UK may or may not identify as male. And the current Lord of Man is Queen Elizabeth. All is translation, and we're always writing our stories. For those of us who have never known societal belonging, for whom it has never included them in their story or me in our story, it is important that we always use the most inclusive language we can to write our life's chapters. But I think it's equally important to hold gentleness around those whose language is still toxic to us. It's important to hold gentleness, not necessarily agreement. This is where we get run afoul. We can hold that their toxic language in gentleness of their pain, but we don't have to allow that toxic language to continue to hurt us. We don't have to share that toxic language anymore. We can see where it comes from a place of fear, and we cannot be defended against it because we have, as the metaphor is, 
shields for that which can't be named. We need to get better at translating so that we can turn harmful words into healing ones. We can turn words of war into stories of achieving peace. Perhaps the most important takeaway from this etymologically for this weekend was the word God does come from the old English word for good, which also comes from a word for libations. <laughs> and it comes from the Sanskrit word to call, to invoke, like we did at the very beginning of this service. And what did we invoke? We invoked hope and good. Invoke good. We are roses with delicate petals, and we have thorns. And we are not alone. We're everywhere. We are companions to the lonely, the excluded, the other. We are the lonely, the excluded, and the other. Made in the image of the divine with tools and words as tools, we create our stories of understanding. Our possibilities are as vast as the names that we give to Bog, to Allah, Hashem, the Great Mother. Thomas Merton wrote in Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, some of you may know it as the Louisville Epiphany, quote, then it was as if I suddenly saw the secret beauty of their hearts. The depths of their hearts where neither sin nor desire nor self-knowledge can reach. The core of their reality, the person that each one is in God's eyes. If only they could see themselves as they really are. If only we could see each other that way all the time. Hatred, no more cruelty, no more greed. I suppose the big problem would be that we would fall down and worship each other. What is God's name? Teacher, potter, eagle, rock. Be still and know that I am. What is God's name? Yours.